Hello everyone, I'm Alexis Fontana and I'm speaking today on behalf of Moss Majorum. He's a fellow French YouTuber like I am and he wrote the script of, the, of this video and he asked me to deliver the speech. Let's get started. Introduction. To some, mostly French feminists, France is the land where it all started. The land of Olympe de Gouges from the French Revolution and Simone de Beauvoir from the mid 20th century. In these perceived good olden days, everyday women were only allegedly claiming for more fairness and equality and freedom. And so early French feminists are widely praised in France. Some go as far as claiming that France has always been the land where women are free and that feminism is indeed the epitome of the French uh, ladies' traditional behavior. To others, French feminists are just following the past, the American past. Perhaps they even lag behind a decade or so. This is mostly true since the 2000s, where the French theory gave birth to the American woke movement, and since then the French activists has mo have mostly been translating American concepts, rather than creating their own. And to be frank, it's quite ugly. Mansplaining gave place to uh, m'explication in French, empowerment became empouvoirment. <laughs> Honestly, uh, most of the terms are now directly used in English, the pink tax, for example, or the male gaze. Contrary to popular belief, the main issue with feminism in France has little to do with the feminists themselves, even the, the worst uh, worshippers of the scum manifesto, etc. Actually, the main issue in France has to do with the laws that are passed against men. The French, the French government, in an attempt to satisfy the never-satisfied feminists, is creating more and more female-only privileges. I will provide in this talk numerous examples of those. In a way, one could say that the French government has been hacked by feminists. Even the president, Emmanuel Macron, said it quite clearly at the beginning of his term. The key cause of my presidency will be women's rights. In this talk, I will talk about the dynamic at the root of the many rows in France, pushing the feminist agenda and enforcing it. And as such, we need to focus on three main entities non-profit organizations, companies, and governments. I will start with a brief presentation of each before explaining how they work together to push the feminist agenda. And as a conclusion, I will give a few remarks on the latest COVID events and somehow uh, how they are uh, affecting the current dynamic. So who are the feminists in France? Let's start with the NGOs. As in all countries, France has a network of, of feminist non-profit organizations responsible for the marches, for the demonstrations, for the protests. Uh, I chose the name non-profit um, rather than NGOs because NGOs are non-governmental organizations, but those rely a lot of, uh, on public money, either directly through some public funding or indirectly through some tax uh, reduction method. I have noticed, like others, that they usually launch a new topic uh, in the public space every couple of weeks. Um, it, it leaves just enough time to raise awareness on some feminist topics, but not enough time for the anti-feminist to debunk uh, the, the, the topic properly and, and find the statistics and find the proof. So as a YouTube content creator, I constantly have the feeling that I'm running after time to react with the proper statistics and evidence to the latest feminist topic. As the list of organizations, one could cite Osé le Féminisme, uh, Osé, um, it means dare to be feminist, or Nous Toutes, us together, as the two main non-profits in France. We also have the Femen, uh, the, well, you know what are the Femen, uh, and another uh, recent non-profit organization has decided to print and glue some placards on the buildings to draw attention to domestic violence. The method has never been proven to be efficient, but city walls are daily covered with new messages to claim that women are heroes or that the government should do more and that men um, are all rapists and all killers. Well, when it's about placard, there's no uh, responsibility behind it, so they, they dare to say what they actually think. Let's move on to the companies. Of course, as you would expect, given the amount of gender specialists and trainings required, there's a booming economy of consultants on training uh, against sexism. So the demand for this kind of services is artificially created by the legal requirements imposed on companies. Uh, 
this demand is, fen is met with a handful of companies, most of which belong to a single person, Caroline de Haas. As a feminist activist, she belongs to the Nutut NGO, the, S2, the Us Together NGO, and as an entrepreneur, she's running several companies providing various services related to gender issues. One of them is specifically, specifically tar targeting sorry, the large corporations in need for seminars against workplace sexism. Another one is providing some female experts for TV channels and radios so that they can show gender-balanced uh, panels of experts. And let's move on to the governments. Until the 70s, France didn't have a Secretary of State for uh, women's issues in general. Charles de Gaulle uh, strongly opposed the ideas as superfluous. In his own words, a Secretary of State for women's rights? What's next? A Secretary of State for knitting? The Secretary of State related to women's issues took several names since the 70s. It actually disappeared between 2007 and 2012 under Nicolas Sarkozy, the president. Before 2007, the Secretary of State had a minor role in the French policies and focused mostly on abortion and birth control methods. Since 2012, it had a growing importance. The current budget for the ministry is over 1.1 billion euros, most of which is dedicated to the French diplomacy. If you're not familiar with the concept, the French diplomacy is a euphemism to say that we are going to send a lot of money to NGOs across the, across the world. The Secretary of State relies on several research groups to do the statistics and work and to suggest some legal changes. Let's name a few of these groups. The HCE, that's the most important, le Haut Conseil à l'égalité, the High Council for Equality between women and, women and men. Clearly, that's the largest group with 50 direct members and a lot more scholars related to gender issues. Its core function is to provide some documents, resources and advice. Some of their recent work include the representation of women on television, the workplace differences or the need for female-only shelters. The second organization is the MIPROF, M-I-P-R-O-F. It provides some statistics about women, uh, about domestic violence, sorry, and sexual assault. And the last one is the INSEE, uh, that's the famous uh, French statistics group, covering anything from unemployment rate to abortion statistics. They also provide some statistics related to the gender pay gap and rapes. So several entities are playing in France. It's basically the same as in any other country. The main difference is that the French government is a large group and large enough to have way more influence on the public debate than in other countries. And as such, influencing the government is the main target of all feminist groups. How French men are treated as second-class citizens? Before going into the details about what is specific to France or not, Let's start with reminding everyone what seems to be common to most gender-centric systems worldwide. Women have choices, men have to pay the bills. In France, abortion is free. Sex change is free. Medically assisted procreation is also free. In some universities and high schools, tampons are free. However, we all know the truth, free for some usually costs something to others. This has nothing to do with patriarchy, it's basic math. There was a study in New Zealand uh, which, uh, on the tax burden and tax gender gap, let's say, which explained that as a demographic, uh, taxes were paid at 77% by men. It's likely that in a socialist-leaning country like France, worldwide champion at taxation level, it's likely that men are paying the cost of the welfare policy in favor of women. The tax gap is not monitored in France, though, so we can only speculate on the issue. Another issue I could bring is the question of shelters, uh, shelters for men victims of domestic violence. I'm sure most of you know the story of Erin Pizze. Well, it hasn't, is that it hasn't changed much since then. Women should feel safe in a female-only shelter, feminist claim in 2020. What about men? Can't they face some form of domestic violence as well? Well, of course they can, but even if they pay most of the taxes of France every year, only women can access such shelters.
Second point, going beyond the money. Let's talk about choice versus duty. At the time of writing this script, in France, there is a law which is currently being studied, uh, which is quickly going towards the one, small, one month paternity leave for men. From an MRA perspective, offering men a chance to take a few weeks to spend time with their newborns sounds like a progress. Actually, some MRAs have been asking for it. But there is a catch. Extended paternity leave has nothing to do with men choosing to spend time with their families. Members of Parliament have quickly realized that no man would take a paternity leave longer than a week or so. So, so they made it mandatory. My, my point with this example, though, is not that men should have no paternity leave at all. My point is that just like women, they, sh they should have a choice. They should have a say. During the paternity process as a whole, only women seem to have some form of, of choice, while men are left behind. MRAs and true egalitarians should all agree on one thing. We should not accept that as a demographic, only one gender has all of the choices and the other one has all of the duties. Let's talk about companies now. Since March 2020, any company with more than 50 employees is required to publish their Gender Equality Index. This index gathers information about the gender pay gap the pay rise that women have after maternity leave, and the gender balance among the top salaries of the company. The pay rise after maternity leave is actually the most sexist of all. It's based on the idea that careers should progress at the same pace between men and women. It's based on the ideology that the pregnancy has no impact on the career, and if you are the manager of some pregnant woman, you should offer her a pay raise and a promotion at the same pace as women who didn't leave the work. And as for the wage gap, we have the answer. Since 2002, there was a paper by Bruno Crépon that the wage gap is in no way a consequence of sexism and discrimination in the workplace. The paper on the topic, using French data, states that most of the, most of the pay gap originates from career choices. Namely, women tend to favor careers that are safer. The public sector, for example, is female-dominated, more compatible with family life, more holidays, for example, and usually in sectors less competitive, which results in lower wages. The paper also points out that, uh, thanks to the French minimum wage policy, women in low-paying jobs are comparatively paid more than men for the same productivity if you take into account the productivity. And since we talk about them, let's talk about the civil servants. There are 7 million in France compared to the 30 uh, million workers and the 67 million inhabitants in France. 7 million civil, civil servants. All police forces are supposed to be trained specifically to manage cases of domestic violence. So you know where it leads. The assumption here is that previously many female um, uh, victims of domestic violence were not taken seriously by police officers. The law uh, that has been passed during the summer in the middle of the pandemic requires doctors to report any form of physical abuse in order to prevent domestic violence. And all of the civil servants in ministries are required to follow the rules for a non-sexist communication. Teachers also they are now required to fight against gender stereotypes. Fourth point, creating parallel systems. I've noticed a trend in uh, all feminist movements across the world, actually, to create parallel systems every time it's possible. In USA, for, exa for example, you can cite the Title IX as a kind of parallel system to the justice system. Since colleges are packed with work activists, the entity behaves as a legal authority while pushing a work agenda. Similarly, one could cite the family courts as a form of parallel, just in parallel system. Just like in USA, the French family courts are ruled by female judges. I read a paper stating that the, the school for a magistrat, the ENM, outputs something like between 77 and 82 percent of women per year. So some believe they are fighting a crusade against uh, patriarchy, one divorce at a time. The rationale behind this desire for parallel systems is simple. If feminists cannot create obvious female privileges in the law, then they can create maybe some niche system that they can control. So this is where things get shady to investigate. 
The Ministry of Justice publishes some reports and statistics. The data is mostly available for anyone willing to read hundred, hundreds sorry, of pages and reports. One could dis discover, for instance, that according to the statistics, for a given crime, men face 30 longer prison time uh, for, for, the, for the same crime. Apparently, this information is not considered newsworthy by the mainstream media in France. Still, it is available, somehow. However, as soon as you get into feminist parallel systems, numbers of and facts vanish. They only exist if they, fit, if they fit the feminist narrative. Otherwise, you won't find them at all. And fifth point, men are guilty until proven innocent. The direct consequence of the parallel systems is that men are no longer considered innocent until proven guilty, by, um, but guilty until proven innocent. A couple of measures from the law against domestic violence passed during this summer, which sums it up quite perfectly. From now on, any police complaint from an alleged victim of domestic violence can lead to removing all forms of weapons from the alleged uh, violent person. The claim is that a man is violent. Sorry, the, the claim that a man is violent can no result in the person being removed any rights to possess firearms and knives. Feminists explained that otherwise the justice system would be too slow and this could lead to the murder of an innocent woman. And of course it did happen. As we all know, if the justice system is too slow, the solution is not to spell it up, but rather to bypass it completely for women. A second example is quite interesting as well. Until now, doctors have to keep information from the patient confidential. From now on, if a doctor suspects that someone is a victim of domestic violence, he has to report it to the police forces. Once again, this is an open door for abuse. Do you want to get a better divorce? Go to your nearest feminist doctor and claim that, they are facing, uh, claim that you are facing domestic violence at home. It's quite easy. And yes, there are some lists of uh, feminist body positive doctors. So conclusion, like in most countries, men's lives have less values. Men in France are treated in second class citizen. They have duties but no choice. They have to pay but they don't benefit from, the, from what they pay for. This is genocentrism as it best. And now let's see what's different in the case of France. Because all of this were common to other countries. So how did they really do it in France? The HCE, the, the place that explains it all. So the HCE is the, the, whole, the, the High Council for Equality, which I've quoted a bit earlier. As one would accept from a group mainly composed of feminists, the organism has a strong ideological bias. Some of their reports suggest that any domestic violence resulting in the murder of a woman is ideologically motivated by sexism. Most of their claims are not backed with fact. They have, for instance, produced a detailed report about misogyny in the media. The report is very far from any academic standard. Claiming, for example, that 83% of YouTube videos are sexist doesn't mean anything when they just took 6 videos as a sample. It's 83%. However, anyone looking into the members of the HCE would immediately realize that most of them have several jobs. They are part-time part working for the government, part-time working for a, a non-profit organization, and part-time working for a company. From a state perspective, recruiting activists is a guarantee that all members have some background, if not expertise, in gender issues. However, it turns out that all of these uh, activists are feminist and LGBTQ plus activists. I recently interviewed an MRA. His name is Maxime Gaget. He, was, uh, he has requested to contribute to the discussions around domestic violence. He was a victim himself of domestic violence for about two years. He managed to escape his abusive partner who locked him inside the house for months and he wrote a book on the topic. He is the living proof that cartoon imagery about the, the good wife and evil husband has nothing to do with the real world domestic violence. What happened? The Secretary of State refused to interview him. Similarly, to my knowledge, the father's organization named SOS Papa 
has never contributed to any governmental decision. The surprising part, though, is that most of their reports and claims are turned into law after a few years. Let's give the example of the gender equality on television. There is a body of civil servants, the CSA, which is in charge of monitoring what TV channels show to the French audience. In 2011, a report showed that women were underrepresented on television in France, especially in expert roles. Consequently, the HCE, the High Council for Equality, suggested that at least 30% of experts on television should be women. The report turned into law, of course. The need for female experts grew. And suddenly, guess who benefited from this? Caroline de Haas. Caroline de Haas, the French feminist, uh, founded a company in 2011 to uh, find female experts for, uh, for the media. So in about seven years, a well-known feminist problem turned into a feminist service. You have to pay for it, otherwise you are overtly sexist. Another example of this happened a couple of years back around the topic of domestic violence. A report was published by the HCE again to ask where is the money for the fight against domestic violence. And yes, that is directly the, the title that they used. The government was written by several feminist non-profit organizations, as well as feminists close to Caroline de Haas, uh, who just so happened to own a company selling seminars and trainings to fight sexism. Following the release of the document, the government financed some seminars about sexism and domestic violence to most policemen, police doctors and judges, and these seminars are not free, obviously. All in all, it seems there are conflicts of interest between the government and uh, the non-profit organizations and the companies selling seminars and uh, gender expertise. Second point, feminist as a top-to-bottom movement. Usually, everyday feminists would like to believe that they are working for a female revolution of a new kind, and they will be the driving force between, be, behind the feminist movement. This is very nice to hear, but it's wrong. Feminist in France, at the moment, is decided behind closed doors, in some governmental groups or organizations. Feminists are no longer fighting against a patriarchal, patriarchal government, as they claim. They are the government. They have large amount of funding, the feminist researchers in university are paid with public money, and some laws are, ba are, pass some laws are passed based on feminist requests. Years ago, during the suffragette area, a century ago, some could claim that average women were the driving force of the movement. Nowadays, it is no longer true. Feminism has lost its genuine activism especially at the top of the NPOs. The most active feminists are no longer doing it because they believe in some values and ideals. They, they do it for the money. At least in some circles, feminism is more of a money machine than a belief. I could take again the example of the French government funding NPOs and companies, but even books would showcase this. Every couple of, mo of months, we have a new book, and uh, the feminist literature is booming, and you could, you could write an essay about uh, how hating, hating men is right. There's a book about how hating men is right, 80 pages long, and it would sell thousands in the next, in the next month. The bottom line is that we, although we all see feminism as, a, as an ideology and a dangerous one, one should also see that uh, it's a market and a cash machine. Last point, how Covid might change things in France. I'm not Nostradamus, but um, there are a few uh, takes in the recent months of Covid and how they could influence feminism in France in the coming years. More urgent matters have made feminism a superfluous matter. Uh, when you are not sure if you will keep your job or when you have a short shortage at the grocery store, the, gen the gender pay gap seems to be a, a very distant problem. At the same time, the government has continued to push some new laws, extended time for abortion, medical assistance for procreation for lesbian women, and domestic violence laws. And in uncertain times, women are usually less feminist, which is a, a survival instinct. I would expect the outrage and vindictive forms of feminism to progressively disappear, at least for a few years. Meanwhile, the business-oriented and power-thirsty feminists are going to keep pushing their agenda. And this is where our missions as MRAs is so critically important. 
We have to warn others of the decision, decisions made behind closed doors and how they affect their laws and their lives. Perhaps most feminists in non-profit organizations are sincerely looking for equality between women, women and men. Perhaps some of them believe that they are equalitarian by supporting feminism. The movement they support, however, has nothing to do with egalitarianism. At best, one could say that it has been driven away from its aim because of the political, financial and egoistic interests. And this is the end of the talk. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you to uh, Moss Majorum who wrote this script. Again, you have to thank him, not me. Thank you very much to everyone and especially to ICMI. Goodbye.